Ivy Morgan has just found out about her true nature. She is a halfling, an offspring born from the coupling of a fae and a human. Knowing that she has the power to change the world, Ivy has to carefully navigate her now dangerous life to prevent a major catastrophe. Ivy has been lied to her whole life and finding out the truth about her heritage is unraveling every carefully constructed belief she has about herself. The fact that the Prince of Fae is looking for her is even more shocking. She is now the target of the prince who wants to use her to procreate. The child born from such a union can undo the spells put around the other world gateways. It would allow all the Fae to come into the world of humans and take over. Ivy remembers the words Ren, her boyfriend, said to her. He is a member of the elite, which is a secret organization within the Order that deals with the matters of the ancient Fae. Ren's duty is killing halflings. The elite cannot let the halfling mate with the prince and produce an apocalypse baby. When a halfling is injured with a thorn stake, their blood bubbles, and Ivy gets to see the phenomena on herself. When Ivy finds out that she is an abomination of nature, she is with Tink, her trusty fairy. She found him near a cemetery one day, and he has been living with her ever since. Tink already knew about Ivy's true nature, and she is beyond aghast when she finds out. He defends himself and says that he did not think things would get worse than they were. Tink has no idea about the second gate. He did not believe any of the court members could come through. Ivy gets angry at him. Tink tells her that he was worried she would hurt herself if she ever found the truth. Ivy dismisses that concern. She fiercely insists that she would never hurt herself. Tink says the only way the apocalypse baby can be born is if Ivy consents to intercourse with the prince. The prince cannot force himself on Ivy to conceive the baby he needs. It lessens Ivy's worries but does not put them to rest. But, Tink tells her there is an even bigger problem now. During her fight with the prince, the prince tasted her blood, and he can now sense Ivy. He will always be able to sense her and find her at will. This puts Ivy in more danger than ever. Ivy asks Tink how to kill the prince. She learns that she will have to dismember his head. But, Tink warns her to keep her true nature a secret from everyone. The prince will not out her because he would not want to risk it. He needs Ivy to ensure that the baby is born, and he will not do anything to put her life in danger. Ivy cannot even tell Rin about it. He is an elite, and it is his duty to kill halflings. Tink suggests that Ivy break up with Ren, but Ivy sternly dismisses that option. Later, she freshens up, eats some food, cuddles up on the couch, and falls asleep. When Ren returns, he finds Ivy asleep. As he watches her fondly, Ivy stirs awake. He informs her that the Order searched the city, but there was no sign of the prince or his knights. Ivy wonders why they are laying low. Ren figures they are probably focused on finding the halfling. That makes Ivy flinch. Ren looks at her with worry in his eyes. Ivy asks about David, and Ren tells her that the man wanted to know if Ivy will be joining work soon. Ren wants her to rest for a few more days. Ivy agrees. She seems lost in thought, and Ren cannot help but fret over her. Ivy feels guilty about hiding her true nature from Ren. But Tink was right. She cannot tell him. When the two get into bed, Ivy wants to spend some romantic moments with Ren. The man would like nothing more than to do that, but he wants to take things slow, since Ivy is still recovering from her fight with the prince. Ivy wonders if David said anything about Val. Ren tells her the Order members are looking for the traitor, but they have not found her yet. They have been suspecting Val of being a halfling. Val's parents are denying the claim, but Ren does not think anyone would outright admit to it, anyway. This worries Ivy. She asks about the crystal that Val took with her, while running away from the headquarters, when Ivy last saw her. Ren tells her that neither he nor David have any idea about what it was. Ren falls asleep, but Ivy remains awake, thinking about her last encounter with Val. She was running away with the crystal, and wishing it wasn't Ivy, chasing after her. The next morning, Ivy calls her school, and finds out that she has to drop out this semester. She is disheartened about it, but she has no time to study, anyway. She has too many other things to worry about. She sits with Tink, and asks him why the prince has not shown up at her doorstep. He can sense her anywhere now. Tink thinks the prince is buying himself some time. He needs to woo her, to be able to conceive a child. He warns her that the prince has zero humanity. He is like an animal who just takes, and does not know how to give. That does nothing to make Ivy feel better. Tink assures her, that he will take care of her, if the prince comes knocking down on her door. Later that night, Ivy dreams about her encounter with the prince. She stirs in her sleep, and that wakes her and Ren up. They spend some romantic moments together, as they kiss and express their love. Soon after, Ivy tells Ren, that she is thinking of spending some alone time tomorrow. Ren tells her that since he is working the evening shift that day, he will take her. Ivy wants to go alone. Ren does not want her to do that, she was only recently attacked by the prince. He worries for her, which agitates Ivy. Ren knows Ivy will go out and look for Val, but she is not supposed to do that. She is still injured, but argues that she is fine now. She does not need his permission, anyway. They get into an argument. Ivy turns on her side and goes to sleep. Ren is still worried about her. The next morning, Ivy gets dressed and arms herself with weapons and the thorn stake. Though Tink tries to stop her, Ivy still leaves. Standing in line to get some pastry, Ivy feels someone standing behind her. She turns and finds the prince. She starts to take out her weapon, but he warns her against it. 
Ivy asks him about Val, but the prince wants to talk to her about something else. Ivy scoffs at his request. The prince warns her not to disregard him. He threatens to hurt the public around them if Ivy doesn't comply. He will kill the humans around there and trick them into believing that Ivy committed the murders. Ivy has no choice but to go with him. They arrive at a public bench and the prince commands Ivy to sit. He often calls her by the nickname Little Bird. Ivy hates that. She snarls at him and tells him not to call her that. When she doesn't sit down, the prince gestures at a man inside a tall building. The man, who was waiting for the prince's command, proceeds to jump off the balcony. Everyone watches as the man climbs up the railing and prepares to jump. Ivy has no choice but to sit down. The prince takes a seat next to her. He makes small talk with her about how the mortal world has changed. He then tells her how his world is dying and that the only way to save it is to permanently open the gates. Ivy accuses him of destroying his world. She will not let him do the same to hers. The prince is amused by the fact that Ivy does not like him. He does not make any effort to woo her, either. Threateningly, he remarks that he would have killed her had he not known how important she was. But now that he knows, he commands that she open the gates for him. Ivy mocks him and rejects his offer. When the prince sniffs her, he smells fear, yet she behaves as though she is not scared of him. That intrigues him. She tells him that she knows her consent matters to make their union fruitful, and promises that the prince will never have her consent. The prince wonders if Ivy's resistance is because of her human mate. Ivy warns the prince to keep Ren out of this. There is nothing at all that he can do or say to make Ivy be with him. The prince grabs her by the neck and tells her that no matter how many times she denies it, she will be consenting sooner than later. Ivy heads to the gift shop and finds it closed. She finds another order member, Dylan, who tells her about changing the headquarters location. Since Val compromised the previous location, it had to be shifted to a more secure place. Ivy enters the headquarter. Ren is not exactly happy to see her there. He had asked her to stay put. But he kisses her anyway, and Ivy's frustration slowly melts away. He asks her where she has been, and Ivy tells him she went to get some food. She stops before she can tell him about her encounter with the prince. Miles arrives there. Ivy notices on the monitor that they have been watching Val's parents' house. Miles tells her they have been monitoring it for the past week. Ivy finds out that the Order murdered Val's parents because they thought they were compromised. The Order members are sure that Val is the halfling. Ivy is left speechless. She takes Ren to the side and asks if he knew about the death of Val's parents. The Order does not have concrete proof of Val being a halfling, yet they unjustly murdered her parents. Ivy is furious. Ren tells Ivy that she does not need to find Val. He will deal with the consequences of it for her. Ivy smiles at that. He is too good to her and promises to call the second he finds Val. Ren will make sure Val is brought to justice. He also promises to come over to her place after work. He tells her he misses her and then leaves. Ivy gets a call from a worried Brighton. It has something to do with her mother. Ivy leaves for her place immediately. When Ivy gets there, Brighton tells her that her mother has vanished. The woman had been acting weirdly since the gate opened. She talks about the places where the Fae lived and how they lived in this world. Merla says that the Order cannot defeat the Prince, only the Fae can. The Order already knew about that, but Merle vanished before she could offer an explanation. Brighton found the journals Merle had left behind. She shows them to Ivy, who finds out about the Good Fae. Merle has a list of names. Brighton tells Ivy that there are Good Fae as well. The ones who came into this world and decided not to feed on humans. They live amongst humans, such Fae worked alongside Order members. Brighton shows Ivy a list of Order members who have worked with such Fae, and Ivy sees her friend Jerome's name on the list. Ivy asks if Brighton knows the location of the Good Fae. The girl shows her some maps, but she has not been able to pinpoint the exact location. Brighton remembers that her mother told her that Ren would know what to do. But Ivy has no idea what that could mean. Later that night, Ivy is in bed, studying the journals, when Ren returns from work. Ren starts to get romantic with her, but Ivy stops him, because they have to talk first. She tells him about Merle being missing, and shows him the journals that detail how the Order used to work alongside the Fae. That gets Ren's attention. Ivy tells him about the good Fae, but Ren cannot believe it. She shows him the journal, and Ren reads it for himself. He points out that Merle struggles with reality a little, so can they even believe her? Ivy knows that, but she points out that Merle recorded these before she lost her sanity. She then tells Ren about Jerome being one such order member. When Ivy says Merle stated he would know what to do, Ren is just as confused as Ivy. He has not heard about this, even though he is an elite member. They decide that they have to find these good fae, even though it's not going to be easy. At night, Ren and Ivy get cozy. They have been holding back, because Ren wanted Ivy's injuries to get better. Now that she is, they get intimate with each other. Soon, they they fall asleep. But a commotion wakes them up. Someone is banging on Ivy's door. Ren and Ivy jump out of the bed and arm themselves. A fey knight breaks into the house. Ren and Ivy fight the burly man, who disarms Ivy with his magic. Then, he takes Ren on. All the commotion wakes Tink up. The little creature is annoyed by the knight. When Tink sees it overpowering Ren, the creature grows to its full size and decapitates the knight. Both Ivy and Ren are shocked to find out that Tink can grow into a full-sized human being. 
Ivy more than anyone else. She gets furious at him for lying to her all this time. Tink tells her being a fairy gives him the ability to shrink in size. She screams at him to get dressed, because growing to his full size, has made Tink grow out of his clothes as well. Ivy tells herself that she is dreaming. She will wake up tomorrow, and Tink will go back to having the height of a Barbie doll. What bothers Ren more is, why that knight was trying to get him. He did not even try to go after Ivy. Tink tells him, it's because Ren was more of a threat than Ivy. Ren is worried about knights coming to attack the Order members in their homes. He decides to buy a deadbolt. When he leaves, Tink apologizes to Ivy, but she does not want to hear it. He lied to her. End of story. Tink tells her that when a fairy enters the human realm, they take on their small form to protect themselves. Ivy is furious, but Tink keeps apologizing to her in a cute manner, which does nothing to calm Ivy down. She tells him she saw the prince earlier that day. Ivy realizes the prince must have sent the knight to get rid of Ren, so he can have Ivy for himself. The next morning, Ren and Ivy spend a sweet moment with each other. Ivy asks for his thoughts on Tink not being a thumb-sized creature. Ren does not suggest kicking the fairy out, but if Ivy did that, he would completely support her. Ivy laughs and kisses him. When they get to work, David is happy to see Ivy back. A man comes up and greets Ren. Ren shakes his hand. He is Kyle, the same man who had put down Ren's best friend Noah, who is also a halfling. He then greets Ivy. David introduces Kyle and another man, Henry, to the Order members. Kyle addresses everyone and tells them that he and Henry have come to find the halfling. He dismisses their belief that Val was the halfling they were looking for. This makes Ivy nervous. She storms away from there. Outside, Ren follows her. He is worried about Ivy. Ivy is distressed and is about to confess that she is the halfling when Henry stops them. His intrusion annoys Ren, but Kyle needs to talk to him. Ivy tells him to go. Reluctantly, Ren agrees. He kisses Ivy passionately, while Henry makes unnecessary comments. Ivy asks Ren to text him when he is done. They go their own ways. Ivy gets to the street, and takes a couple of seconds to catch her breath and align her thoughts. Suddenly, she feels something strange. She turns around the street corner and finds Val. She takes off running. Ivy chases Val, and they end up on the roof of a building. Ivy confronts Val, and asks her why she betrayed them. Val did not think Ivy would follow her and the prince like that, but Ivy thought Val was being controlled by the Fae. Never in a million years would it have occurred to her that Val was betraying them. She demands to know why Val did that. Because of it, her parents had to suffer. Val thinks that was sad, but it was collateral damage. She tells Ivy that she will not understand her reasons. Val yells at Ivy and asks if she is happy to be working for the Order, because she is not. She does not want to put her life on the line every day. They cannot even quit their jobs, because this is what they were born to do. She hates working for the Order, and she knows Ivy does too. Ivy tells her that she could have walked away instead of betraying them. Val is fascinated by the other side of the Fae. She admits that she has been with the Fae intimately. This shocks Ivy to her core, but Val is not remorseful. She tells Ivy she was caught by some Fae several months ago, and they took her Marlon. She traded her loyalty for her life. She promised to help find the Order members guarding the gates, and soon, Val realized that the Fae are going to win this war. She wanted to side with the winning team. Ivy is disgusted to find that Val enjoys being fed on. Why would anyone deliberately want that? Val tells her that when someone wants to be fed on, it does not hurt, but it makes them feel good. It is like a drug. Ivy realizes that the guy Val had been seeing was a Fae, and that she was feeding him information, so she could sleep with him. Val snarls at Ivy for lecturing her, when she is the halfling, and will soon be the prince's plaything. Ivy will not be doing any of that, because she's not a coward who betrays her own kind. Unlike Val. Val and Ivy come to blows. The two women start fighting each other. Val knows that Ivy does not have it in her to enter, and so, she only needs to stall her for a bit longer. Ivy wonders why Val needs to stall. They fight some more, and Ivy hears the calling of a crow. The crow comes over the roof, and turns into the Fae Prince. He came because he smelled Ivy's blood. Val tries to get close to the prince, and Ivy warns her not to. The girl tells her she has already been very near him. The prince asks Ivy why she is bleeding. He finds out that it was Val who hit her. Val tries to explain to him why she had to. She calls him by his name, Drake. The prince gets annoyed by that. He never gave the woman permission to address him so personally. Val apologizes to him, and that makes her seem even more pathetic to Ivy. Ivy tells him that Val cannot help him lure Ivy to the dark side, so whatever Val has promised him is a lie. Ivy enraged the prince. Drake gets angry and flings Val off the roof. Ivy is shocked. She brings out the thorn stake and threatens Drake, but it only amuses him. Instead of doing anything, he tells her goodbye and flies away. Ivy is left stunned. She exits the building and finds a crowd hovering over Val's still corpse. She leaves there, completely shaken up, and calls David to inform him of Val's passing. She tells him that they were fighting, and Val fell off the roof. She doesn't mention the prince. Soon after, Ren calls Ivy and asks her to stay put wherever she is. He will come and get her. When Ren arrives, Ivy is lost in thought. He holds her straight and inspects her wounds. He consoles her, but Ivy abruptly confesses that she is the halfling. Ren cannot understand why she is saying something like that. 
Ivy tells him that it is the truth. Ren believes Ivy is just making speculations. He assures her that they will find the halfling. Ivy takes him to a secluded alleyway. She is scared that Ren will be disgusted, when he sees what she truly is. Ren tells her that he can never be disgusted with her, and that whatever reason she has to think that she is a halfling, they can prove it wrong. Ivy brings out the thorn stake, and pricks herself with it. When Ren sees her blood bubbling, he cannot believe it. Ivy tells him that she loves him, and could not lie to him anymore. Ren is completely shocked. First, she shows him who she really is, and then confesses her love. What is he even supposed to do now? Ren is so confused, shocked, and lost. He goes away to see David. He needs time to process. He leaves Ivy with a broken heart. Ivy gets home, and breaks down over everything that has happened that day. Morning comes, but sleep has eluded her. Ivy freshens up, and finds Tink in the kitchen. He asks about Ren. Ivy sees Tink fishing in the sink, but the fish are only inanimate. Ivy tells him that she and Ren had a fight, and that Ren will not be around for a while. Ivy lies to Tink about Ren still not knowing her true nature. She asks him what he would do if she wasn't around. Tink assures her that he would be fine. Before leaving, she asks if Tink wants a pet fish. The fairy wants a cat instead. Ivy argues that the cat will eat him up, since he is the size of its paw, but Tink still insists. Ivy leaves the house. She goes to see Jerome with some chocolate cake. Jerome wonders if David sent Ivy, but he did not. The old man starts to pull out a gun from his pocket. Ivy tells him to back down, she is not there to kill him. She asks him about the good fae, who do not feed on humans. Jerome realizes that Merle has filled Ivy in on these secrets. He tells her that while it was true earlier, it is all in the past now. Those communities do not exist anymore. Ivy tries to get more information from him, but the old man commands her to leave. Leaving his house, Ivy gets a call from David. He tells her that Ren has not shown up for work, and he has not been answering calls either. Ivy decides to visit the headquarters, and check for Ren's car in the garage. In the parking lot, suddenly, a fey man tries to approach Ivy. But before he can get any closer, a fey woman runs at him, and ends him with a dagger. She then runs towards Ivy. Ivy manages to bring her own dagger out, and the woman impales herself on the iron. She disappears as well. Shocked and confused, Ivy heads inside the headquarters. She lets David, Henry, and Kyle know about her bizarre encounter. She informs them that the female Fae was carrying one of their daggers. Kyle asks her about Ren, and Ivy is worried to find out they still have not heard from him. Kyle looks at Ivy skeptically, and wonders why Ren asked him about the Fae who do not feed on humans, the night before. Ivy pins it on Ren's curiosity. They are all worried about Ren's disappearance. David receives a call, and finds out that the Fae Club is swarming with human police. Ivy wants to go investigate, but David gives her paperwork instead. She protests, but the man does not let up. Ivy starts working. She asks Miles about the crystal that Val had stolen from them, but he tells her it did not mean much. Miles has doubts about Ivy, and her past. He has always had doubts about her. He wonders why the people close to her, like Val and Ren, betray them, or go missing. Miles warns her. He has a feeling something is off about the girl, and has her on his radar. After work, Ivy is about to leave for the club, when one of her colleagues shows her pictures of the victims. The human bodies are blue and drained of life, after being fed on by the Fae. Later that night, Ivy dreams that Ren is one of those victims. She wakes up with a start. She tells Tink about the details of the Fae's brutality. She tells him that Ren is missing. That shocks Tink as well. He guesses that the prince might have captured Ren. Ivy is in no mood for jokes. In the morning, Ivy is at the park, when Ren shows up behind her. She is relieved to see him. She asks him where he has been, but Ren does not answer. Ivy goes off on a tangent, telling him all about the prince, and his real name. He killed Val, not Ivy. She reminds him that she is the halfling, and that he came to New Orleans to make sure she did not live. Ren assures her that it will all be okay. He does not seem upset, or angry with her, either. Ivy is confused by Ren's behavior, but is happy to know he does not hate her. The two go to get some food. Ivy wonders if this is Ren's plan to hand her over to the elite. He assures her that she is safe with him. The elite and the people at work are not his priority at the moment. As Ren eats, Ivy notes that he does not like them. That is odd though. Ren usually loves them. Ren wants to go somewhere private, and since Tink is at Ivy's place, he decides to take her to his apartment. Once at his place, Ivy disarms herself. Ren tries to make her comfortable, since she seems nervous. Ren apologizes to her for overreacting, and leaving her hanging that day. Ivy is happy to have him back. She feels relieved that he is not disgusted by her, for being a halfling. She was worried she would lose him forever. Ren kisses Ivy, and the two of them start getting intimate. Things begin to speed up, but before they can go any further, Henry comes knocking on Ren's door. Ren and Ivy stop kissing, as he goes to open the door. Henry walks in, and is appalled to see Ren safe and sound, getting it on with Ivy. Suddenly, Ren snaps Henry's neck, and the man falls to the ground. 
Ivy is stunned. Why would Ren do something like that? Calm as a cucumber, Ren tells her that Henry knew about Ivy's real identity. Ivy does not understand how that can be true. If they knew, they would not just let her roam freely. Ren tells her they were probably hoping she would lead them to the prince. Ivy is shocked and confused. She goes away, while Ren takes care of the body. On her way back, Brighton calls Ivy and gives her the location of a place that might be a safe haven for the Fae. Brighton thinks she has located her mother. She guides Ivy to that place, and Ivy decides to check it out. While on her way, Ivy gets a call from Tink. He says that he has a surprise for her when she gets home. When Ivy reaches the location Brighton gave her, she finds that the place is vacant and long abandoned. Nothing out of the ordinary seems to be going on there. Then she gets a phone call from Ren. She heads over to his place. Back at Ren's apartment, Henry's body has been taken care of. Ivy is appalled at Ren's composure. He literally just murdered his colleague, and he's acting like it's no big deal. Ren reasons that he was just trying to protect Ivy. Ren takes a sip of his coffee. Ivy wants a sip too. But when she drinks it, the coffee is way too bitter. Ren never takes bitter coffee. He always adds sugar to his coffee, and way too much. This sets Ivy off. She gets suspicious, and asks him about her college major. Ren acts confused. Ivy gets even more suspicious when he does not answer her. She asks what name he called her when they first met. Realization dawns on Ivy, the person in front of her is not Ren. She demands to know where Ren is. The imposter keeps the charade going. He acts confused, and tries to ensure Ivy does not hurt her head. Ivy snaps at him, and demands the real Ren's location. The imposter gives away the act. His eyes glow icy blue. It is a fay. He advances toward Ivy, and she points her weapon at him. The two fight, and the imposter manages to overpower Ivy. He calls her little bird, and Ivy realizes it is the prince, Drake. He disguised himself as Ren. Ivy demands that he tell her where the real Ren is. The prince tells her that he is occupied elsewhere. The prince had plans to impregnate Ivy while he was masquerading as Ren, so that he would have her consent. Angry, Ivy fights him. But the prince is stronger. He manages to subdue her, and pulls out her protective clover. He then forcefully kisses her, and feeds on her, which makes her weak. Ivy loses consciousness. When Ivy wakes up, she finds herself in a strange room. She is being held captive by the prince. A fae enters, and Ivy arms herself with a vase. The fae woman tells her that Ivy will bear the consequences if she misbehaves. Ivy attacks the fae with the vase. The woman gets angry and pins Ivy to the wall. She bites Ivy and puts a leash around her neck. Ivy faints due to the bite. When she wakes up, she is on the bed. The chain around her neck is tied to the headrest, and Ivy cannot move. She struggles with it when the prince walks in. He mistreats her and enjoys seeing Ivy struggle with the chains around her neck. He promises that he will take from her what he needs, and she will comply willingly. Ivy scowls at him. She tries to reason with him, but the prince is beyond that. He takes her leash and drags her behind him. He takes her around the house, which is filled with all kinds of fae, and brings her to a feeding room. Ivy is aghast to see human beings willingly letting the fae feed on them. She is disgusted. Ivy realizes that Drake was responsible for that tragedy at the club. Drake dominates her. He brings her out to a secret room, where Ivy sees Ren being held captive. His hands are chained to the wall, and he is barely conscious. Ivy is scared to see Ren in this condition. She goes to him and cries, begging for his release, but Drake is relentless. She finds out that a fae woman named Brina has been torturing Ren all this while. She might have even taken liberties with him, in his unconscious form. This angers Ivy. She will do anything to free Ren. Drake says he will set Ren free, if Ivy submits to him. Ivy agrees, but she needs time to get comfortable, to be able to consensually be with him. They make you a deal. Ivy has three weeks to prepare, before she consents to conceive a child with Drake. He lets Ren go. Even though the man protests, he is so weak, he can barely hold his head up. Ren threatens to kill Drake, but Drake takes Ivy away from him. Once outside the room, Drake warns her to not trick him, or else he will make her wish she were not alive. The next morning, two fae women come to Ivy's room. One of them is Brina, the woman who tortured Ren. Brina riles Ivy up by telling her the things she did to Ren. Ivy is bubbling with anger. The other fae woman is much gentler. Her name is Fae. She calms Ivy down by telling her that Brina only tortured Ren a little and nothing else. She did not take her liberties with him. Ivy is still not calm, but she is ushered to the bathroom. Her chains are undone, and she is asked to bathe and shave. Later, Ivy is given a sheer black dress to wear. Ivy does not want to wear it, but she has no other option. The prince wants her to. When alone, the woman tries not to break down. Back outside, Ivy attacks Brina the first chance she gets. She manages to poke the Fae woman's eyes. Fae pulls Ivy off Brina. Later, the prince visits Ivy. He tries to rile her up. He says Brina managed to lure Ren to her by using her femininity. He tries to plant a seed of doubt in Ivy's brain. Ivy fights his mind games. He tells her when a fae feeds from a human, they can see what is inside their mind. What he found in Ren was concern over Henry and Kyle finding out about Ivy. Another thing he found out, what's amusing to Drake, is that he felt the same fear in her. He reminds Ivy that she has 17 days left before her deadline is up. Ivy is disgusted by him. 
the only thing ensuring her life right now is the deal they have. Drake tells her that he is considering keeping her, even after the baby is born. He will hold her captive in a cage. Drake threatens her to behave. He then drags her by the chains and brings her to the feeding room. He tells her that the Fae need humans to survive, without them, they die. Drake tells Ivy that a halfling can feed, just like a Fae does. He forces the girl to feed on a human and embrace her Fae nature. Ivy has no choice but to comply with his demand. When she is done, Ivy feels dizzy and relaxed. Drake takes her back to her room and tries to force himself on her, but Ivy weakly denies him. So long as she is not consenting, he cannot do anything. Later, Drake leaves. When Ivy regains her senses, she notices that the wound from when the Fae bit her has healed already. Ivy remembers that she had fed on a human being, and that makes her sick. She rushes to the bathroom. She feels sick and disgusted with herself. Standing under a shower, Ivy tries to wash herself of the sin she committed. Later that night, Ivy is in her room, but she is not wearing any collar. The Fae guarding, her Fae, has been gentle and kind to Ivy, all this while. Ivy doubts her intentions. She still refuses to eat food. Another Fae walks in and announces the prince's demand to see Ivy. Ivy goes willingly, not wanting to be chained again. When she enters the prince's room, she finds him getting intimate with another woman. He purposely puts on a show for Ivy to entice and invite her. It only makes her more disgusted with him. He tries to brainwash Ivy. He tells her that while her loyalties lie with Ren, if he felt that way about her, he would have tried to rescue her. Ivy does not need anyone to save her. The prince brings her back to the feeding room and makes her feed from a human again. In her room, Ivy breaks down, feeling sickened by what she has done. Days pass, and every day the prince makes Ivy feed off humans, against her will. Now, there are only two days left, before Ivy's deadline is up. When the prince comes to visit her, she demands to talk to him. The prince does not feel the need to talk to her, but Ivy insists it will make her feel comfortable. The prince reminds her that he has been extremely patient with her. Ivy tells him that despite his leniency, he has been controlling her, this entire time. She needs air. The prince agrees and lets her have what she wants. Ivy demands to go out in the sun. Drake is reluctant at first, but eventually agrees. He takes her out to the garden, and the two of them walk side by side. He asks Ivy to start talking. Ivy asks him what will happen once the baby is born, and the gates are opened. The Fae will cross over to the human realm. Drake ensures her that the Fae will have complete control of the humans, before they even know it. Ivy does not believe it will be that easy, since there are billions of human beings in this realm. The prince is not worried about that. There are millions of Fae too. The prince tells her, Fae have been operating in higher places all over the world. They have been slowly infiltrating the earth. Ivy is astounded to learn that, but she still tells him that the humans will not go down without a fight. Drake is bored with this conversation. It is time for Ivy to feed. Ivy has more questions, but Drake does not care. Ivy protests that she does not want to feed, but Drake wants her to embrace the Fae in her. Ivy tries to run away, but Drake stops her. He can command her at will. He brings her to feed, and Ivy, having no other choice, feeds. Later that night, Faye frees Ivy from her shackles. She wakes Ivy up and tells her the prince is not in the house. This is Ivy's only chance to escape. Ivy feels drowsy from the feeding. Faye tells her that if she keeps feeding this way, she will get addicted. Ivy slowly regains her senses. The prince is not in the house, and Ivy needs to escape. Ivy is surprised that the Fae woman is willing to help her. Faye tells her the order is not the only one trying to prevent the gates from opening. Ivy gets dressed quickly and arms herself. Faye tells Ivy that she will not kill a single Fae. She can incapacitate them, but that is it. Ivy is beyond capable of doing that herself. She follows the Fae woman outside and descends the stairs undetected. They run into some Fae in the foyer, but Ivy and the Fae woman fight them off. Fae stops Ivy from killing any more Fae. Ivy yields to her request and just incapacitates the Fae. They make their way out of the house and run into the forest. While they fight off some Fae warriors, one of them renders Fae immobile. Then, he fights Ivy and overpowers her. Just when Ivy is about to be harmed, Ren kills the Fae and saves Ivy. At first, Ivy has a hard time believing that it is the real Ren. She looks around and sees more Fae around them. Tink, in his bigger form, comes hopping through the forest, calling out Ivy's name. He is so happy to see her. The two hug and reunite, but it is time to go. Tink carries Ivy, and they all leave. In the car, the new Fae introduce themselves as Caleb and Dane. Ivy realizes that they are going to the old power plant, the place that Brighton had guided her to. Caleb tells her that they know Merle, and she is with them. Ivy realizes that these are the good Fae. The woman who helped her escape is also one of them. Tink tells her that fairies do not have to feed on humans to survive. They age and die, but slowly. He is 200 years old, which is 20 years old in human years. Ivy promises the Fae people that she will protect their secret. Neither the Prince nor the Order can find out about them. They have heavily glamoured the powerhouse, so it is safe for the Fae who live there. When they reach there, Dane opens the gate for Ivy. A blue and pink light shines on the door, and the glamour is revealed to Ivy's eyes. She passes through and finds herself in a completely magical place. Ren tells Ivy these people have been living with her for a long time. Faye tells her this place can lodge about 100 Fae in a day. This is a sort of safe haven for them. 
Tink requests the room overlooking the garden, for Ivy. Ivy needs to freshen up and feel safe. Ren and Ivy still do not talk to each other. In her room, Tink asks her to freshen up. Ivy asks if the door can be locked. Tink assures her that it only locks from the inside. She is not being held captive anymore. Ivy will need some time to get used to that. When Tink leaves, Ivy gets cleaned up. She gets into bed and tells herself that she is safe now. Tink re-enters the room. He has some of Ivy's clothes and a surprise for her. There is a sling across his shoulder and there is something inside it. Tink shows her the cat inside his sling bag. His name is Dixon. Ivy feels happy to see the little creature. She is not mad at all. Tink asks her to tell him what happened, but Ivy wants to know their side of the story first. Tink tells her that a week after Ivy left, Ren showed up. He had no idea how to get back to Ivy. Then a face showed up, wanting to kick Ren, but Tink and Ren took care of it. They could not go to the order, because then they would find out the truth about Ivy. So Tink and Ren had to work together. Ivy is surprised to hear that Tink worked alongside Ren, to find her. The two do not really get along. But Tink did it for Ivy, and so did Ren. The mention of Ren makes Ivy sad. She is not sure how he feels about her, anymore. Tink assures her that Ren cares for her deeply. He was ready to storm the prince's house to get her back. Ren barely slept or ate while she was missing. Tink worries about Ivy, but he is sure that whatever the fate did to her, Ivy is strong enough to bounce back from it. He assures her that she will be okay. There is a knock on the door, and Tink leaves to give her space. Ren is at the door. When they are alone, he regrets not having gotten to Ivy sooner. Ivy tells him that it is not his fault. But Ren believes it is. If he had paid attention, the Fey woman would not have been able to capture him. Ren wants to talk about their relationship. He asks Ivy to not shut him out. Ivy finally tells him how she got tricked by the prince when he took Ren's form. She wanted to believe that Ren had forgiven her so badly that she did not even question him once. Not even when he did not eat the pastry. Ivy worries about what could have happened had Henry not shown up that day and interrupted them. The prince would have taken complete liberties with Ivy without her even knowing that it was not Ren. Ren feels enraged. He promises to kill the prince for forcing himself on Ivy. Ivy reminds him that Brina did the same to him. She also tells him how she gouged the woman's eyes out for hurting Ren. Ren admires Ivy's bravery. He tells her that he loves her. His confession takes Ivy by surprise. She is the halfling. How can he love her? But Ren does not care about what she is, only who she is. Ivy reminds him what he was sent here to do. To find and end her. Ren simply does not care. He would never let anything harm Ivy. Conflicted still, Ivy confesses the bad things she has done. She tells him how she was made to feed on humans. How can Ren still love her? What if she ever did something like that to him? Ren knows that Ivy will never hurt him, because she loves him, just as he loves her. He reminds her that she was forced to feed. She would never willingly do so to anyone. Overwhelmed by everything, and relieved to have Ren back, Ivy crawls into his arms and cries. Ren consoles her, and makes her feel safe and protected. A full day goes by, and Ivy keeps resting. She wakes up one morning, and finds Ren waiting for her by her bedside. He makes her feel better. Ren returns Ivy her clover necklace, and tells her that he will take her to meet the rest of them, once she showers. Ivy kisses Ren, happy to be back with him. After Ivy freshens up, she goes downstairs, and meets the rest of the Fae, inhabiting the safe haven. Brighton is there too. She hugs Ivy, happy to see her safe. Ren introduces him to Tanner, the Fae who runs this place. He makes Ivy feel comfortable. He fills her in on how their ancestors left the other world, because the ruling court was making them murderers, and ruining their realm. Brighton tells her that most Fae there, belong to the summer court. The Fae who did not comply with the Winter Court started to be hunted down, like the rest of Tink's kind. Tanner was impressed when he found out that Ivy took care of Tink all this while. He believes that she can be trusted. Ivy wonders if these people tried to seek her out before. When Tanner denies it, Ivy tells them about her encounter with those two Fae. Merle, who has been a silent spectator all this while, walks up to Ivy and cups her cheeks. She asks her if the prince was successful in planting his seed. When Ivy tells her no, only then does Merle relax. She hugs the girl, delighted that she will not have to enter now. Brighton reprimands her mother, but the lady only told the truth. Faye comes to Ivy's defense and tells her that they do not kill humans, no matter the circumstance. Ivy wonders why Merle told Brighton that Ren would know what to do with the journals. Merle takes one look at Ren and smiles brightly. It is because the man has trust in his eyes. Ren lets Ivy know that these Faye can send the prince back to the other world, permanently. Ivy is instantly intrigued. When Fay's family left the other world, they took a very powerful crystal from the king and gave it to the order for safekeeping. When the order moved it without the Fay's knowledge, this created a rift between the two kinds. Fay tells Ivy this crystal can send the prince back to the other world for good. Once they find the crystal, they need a drop of the halflings and a royal's blood to perform the ritual. But the hard part is that the ritual must be completed in the other world. That means the gates have to be opened. Ivy and Ren are in the garden when Tink joins them. Ivy has fun listening to Ren's and Tink's cute, friendly bantering. It makes her happy. She thanks the two boys for not giving up on her. She is so grateful. Ren lets her know that she never has to thank them for something like that. For once, Tink agrees with him. 
With her two boys next to her, Ivy feels safe and loved. She believes that she will be okay soon. She has hope. She kisses Ren, and for a little while, all is well in their safe haven. But not for long, because Prince Drake has the crystal in his possession. And he is enraged. 